Hello. Uh, can everyone hear me? It sounds pretty good, I think. Uh, welcome. Is everyone having a good DevOps so far? Yeah. It's, been, uh, it's good to be back. I haven't been here for a uh, couple of years now. I did DevOps US this year, DevOps London, my kind of hometown. It's awesome to be back. So, yeah, welcome. The title hopefully speaks for itself, Continuous Delivery with Containers, the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is what we're going to be looking at in the next 50 or so minutes. To kind of set the scene, the expectation around containers is pretty big, yeah? I love some Docker, love some Kubernetes, but the expectation is pretty big. The idea being, you kind of package up your app, you put it in these nice shiny containers, and you ship it, and we're good to go, yeah? The reality that many of us are dealing with is our apps are a little bit of a tire fire, yeah? We've all got kind of problem apps, yeah? And trying to carve them up and chuck them in containers can be quite challenging. It actually leads to tire fire in a container, yeah, quite often. And you'll see these people down here, the firefighters, this is what we commonly refer to as DevOps in the industry, yeah? This is how I make my money as a consultant. But all jokes aside, I believe that continuous delivery is a strong way to codify and kind of enforce, for want of a better word, certain properties within our our process of developing software. We create a build pipeline, we you know, put functional requirements in, we put non-functional requirements in, and we avoid the tire fire or migrate away from the tire fire. And continuous delivery is the catalyst. The fact we're using Java and containers is almost implementation details, but obviously we're all here because we love the JVM, love Java, and we love containers as well. So we're going to be talking about that. Setting the scene, continuous delivery is a large topic. I've recently started writing a book on it. I've got a small mini book out already, but a, a bigger book's coming along. And I'm loving the writing of the book kind of stuff. It's allowing me to put my thoughts together, but it's made me realize that continuous delivery is a big, big topic. I'm not going to be focusing on things like value stream today. These things in my mind are super, super important. Always understand the why of what you are doing. And value stream mapping, the understanding business flow is super critical to getting the most out of developing software. But we're not going to talk about that today due to time. I'm not going to talk about much about PaaS and serverless, like Cloud Foundry, I think is super interesting. Uh, I know Chris is doing a talk directly after me about uh, Lambda. It's a great talk. I've seen it already, so stay in here for that talk if you want to learn more about serverless. I, I think they're super interesting, but this talk assumes you're all in on containers. Something like Docker, something like Rocket, something like Kubernetes, something like e uh, ECS or Mesos, whatever. I'm not going to live code because, to be honest, I'm rubbish. I leave it to the experts like Josh Long. Josh can like type faster than I can like type in general when he's on stage. He's amazing at these things. I'm going to cover more of the high-level kind of stuff today. And the mini book goes into more detail. I'm doing a book signing like directly after this, so you can get a free copy of the, the book there afterwards. If you go follow me down to the O'Reilly booth uh, outside of the, um, the main area uh, just after this talk. So... That what I would like you, I'm kind of trying to prime you, I would like to do this at the beginning of talks, what would I like you to take away from this talk is my kind of three level, three um, uh, high level bullet points. And one is that the container image now becomes the single artifact in a build pipeline. No longer is it the jar, the war, the ear. We're putting those in a container. Yeah? We're putting our app server maybe in a container. That is becoming the single thing that flows down the pipeline. We put it in early, we test it all the way down through that container image. Adding metadata is super, super important. Metadata is useful for many things, but in particular for things like provenance, governance, and the software supply chain. And we're only just starting to see some of the ramifications of this now with things like the Equifax breach. Yeah? We need to get, I think we as an industry, need to get better at metadata, annotating our software, you know, it helps us understand what we're deploying into production and what's there and, and kind of gives us more control over the software supply chain and helps avoid issues if we can, like Equifax. We must also validate container constraints on system quality attributes or non-functional requirements, as people often call them. Containers do alter the way the JVM behaves and the way um, kind of our apps behave. So does cloud. I did a talk at Java 1 about five years ago when I talked about cloud. And a lot of the things I talked about in that talk are very similar and I'm going to talk about today in containers. We as developers need to know kind of one level up and one level down, at least the kind of core details. And when I mean one level down, we need to understand the fabrics we are deploying our applications on. 
Yeah, now, I'm mainly going to be talking Java today. My expertise is mainly in Java. I do a bit of Go these days, a bit of JavaScript. I've been doing that for time, actually. I work as an independent consultant over in London. Also work in the US, a bit around Europe as well. I'm doing a consulting CTO gig for a company that's specializing in microservice testing frameworks. So if any of you have heard of Hoverfly, Specto Labs produced Hoverfly. I'm CTO or consulting CTO there. So I can talk more about Hoverfly and, uh, after the talk or so. But primarily, I'm really getting into continuous delivery over the last sort of and three years. And I'm realizing that continuous delivery can be a catalyst to drive change in technology and in the teams and in the organization stuff. So you can check out a bunch of my other talks online. Um, I talk about the, the sort of more softer skills as well sometimes. Today it's more focused on, on the tech. I do love getting involved in Twitters at Daniel Bryant UK. You've got 280 characters now to spam me, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's pretty obvious, but I am not a wrestler. Yeah, definitely not a wrestler. That's Daniel Bryan not Daniel Bryant, yeah? And I've started getting tweets recently, like people are thinking that I'm the wrestler, and that's a bit weird, yeah? But some of the stuff they say is even weirder, yeah? People tweet weird stuff to celebrities. I am not a celebrity. <laughs> but please, um, please tweet at Daniel Bryant UK, yeah? That's my handle. I'm, I'm not the wrestler. Maybe a future career or something. But what you're here for today is continuous delivery, <laughs> not me talking about wrestlers. Uh, is everyone pretty comfortable with continuous delivery as a topic, Yeah? Everyone pretty happy with sort of continuous delivery, focusing on fast feedback, um, short cycles of delivery, and optimizing for that feedback, optimizing for that learning. People who read Jason Dave's book, for example, awesome book. If you haven't, I'd sorely recommend. We're talking a lot about continuous delivery of late, but many people I bump into in my consulting journeys haven't necessarily read the book and understood the foundations. And it becomes a bit of a telephone game there where some people think continuous delivery is different. Maybe they think it's continuous deployment. Every code that we do as, a de we do as developers must go into production straight away. That's not what continuous delivery is about. It's about proving that every change we make is not going to break stuff and it's going to add value. Speed and stability is key to continuous delivery. If we, as developers, and I'm assuming most of us in the room are developers, or QA, or ops, or those kind of um, engineering disciplines, um, if we can meet the speed and the stability requirements of our business, job done. That is continuous delivery. Yeah? Hopefully not controversial to the DevOps audience, creation of a build pipeline is mandatory for continuous delivery. Uh, this should be pretty good in this awesome size screen. This is kind of a standard Java pipeline that I've been working on over the many years. Hopefully you'll recognize it, we'll walk through. You know, you're coding on your local machine, you hopefully do three amigos, sit down, your developers, QA, business people, come up with requirements, hopefully come up with some system quality attributes. This is the scalability we need, this is the security we need, for example. We code away, we push up to GitHub, Bitbucket, that kind of thing. We do some CI, we do maybe Jenkins, Circle, Travis, take your pick on what you want to use. We then maybe do some code quality analysis, like SonarCube, uh, FindBugs, CheckStyle, PMD, that kind of good stuff. And then we um, push it into an artifact repo, JFrog Artifactory, Nexus, um, Cenotype Nexus. Um, and then we push it into QA, and we start doing testing. Yeah. So testing gets more realistic as we work through the pipeline. Staging, you're probably using, say, sandboxes of third parties rather than mocks, perhaps in QA. And when you get through to production, it's the real deal. Yeah. Now, this all can be automated. We're talking about this kind of more as we go on. But what our people often forget with this continuous delivery pipeline is you need to close the loop. Yeah, we need to get that feedback going, and we need to automate that as well. So things like automated canarying, log analysis, uh, metric analysis, that kind of stuff is all good thing. Bottom line, we need to get that feedback to prove our initial hypothesis. When the business gives you a kind of you know, requirement, they're proving, they're, they want us to prove a hypothesis. Yeah? Well, as a team, I should say, we want to prove a hypothesis. Does this improve conversion? Does this new tweak uh, get us more money? That kind of thing. We also need to get that feedback going on for the architecture and the ops as well. I'm assuming many people in this room are looking at microservices. I won't send the M word too much here. here. But microservices, um, it's all about the kind of feedback and so forth. Definitely from a business angle, but also from an, operation, uh, sorry, from an architectural point of view. I've seen some people do microservice migrations, and then the microservices themselves have become mini monoliths. Yeah? So you need some kind of analysis, some kind of complexity analysis, on your microservices as it's going along to make sure they're not getting bigger and bigger and out of control, for example. So that's the kind of, um, hopefully nothing controversial up to that point, the kind of scene set of what continuous delivery is, particularly in the JVM space. Containers, you know, I'm assuming most people are familiar with Docker. People familiar with Docker? Awesome, it's like a Mexican wave, brilliant, that's brilliant. So it's worth bearing in mind, yeah, 
that we, I mean, again, I'm assuming most of the DevOps audience, like myself, is primarily in the JVM space. It's turtles all the way down for us as Java developers, JVM developers. We're, we're, the JVM itself is a virtual machine. We're now deploying into operating system virtualization, which is containers, yeah? And we're typically running on Zen or KVM in the cloud. So there's multiple levels of virtualization, and we've got to respect that as developers. It does alter the properties of the, of the fabric we're deploying onto. Primary technologies, Linux technologies, um, based in containers, I'll mention them a few times, so I just want to prime so we're all on the same page. Things like control groups, C groups, give you resource control at a, a kind of Linux process level. Namespaces give you um, sort of uh, namespacing of the network stack, of the process stack, that kind of thing. And a rootfs is a different file system, different root than is actually on your machine. So if you trash the rootfs of a container, you're not trashing your root file system. Docker have done a fantastic job. I'll, you'll hear me probably conflate accidentally Docker and containers along, along the way of this talk, but because Docker are kind of the face of, the, of, the, uh, of face of containers at the moment. They've done a fantastic job with the marketing, fantastic job with the developer experience. They're doing fantastic work in the enterprise now. So Docker has made the kind of container thing popular. I, I sort of was using containers a little bit before Docker and, and pre 1.0. Love Docker stuff. Also played around with Rocket, with LXD from Canonical, and increasingly looking at Windows containers these days, which is super interesting as well. But this is what containers are. This is kind of how they change the pipeline in my mind. This is just a model. Again, every model, wrong, uh, every model is wrong, sorry. Some are useful. I think it changes from this to this, yeah? So from kind of this pipeline to this pipeline. And it's fundamentally not massively different. Number one there on the left, changes kind of how we develop locally a little bit. Number two is how we package our artifacts, our jars, our wars. Um, number three is kind of how we now do testing, both functional and non-functional. And four is how we actually deploy our containers. Um, fundamentally now, I think most of us are agreed that when we're deploying containers, we need something like Kubernetes, something like Amazon ECS something like Mesos, something to schedule and orchestrate the containers for us. And this is kind of partly out of complexity of, of the more moving parts, but it also gives us a lot of advantages because we as humans can't work as fast or as efficiently as machines in terms of scheduling. This is why I believe Kubernetes is, uh, and, and frameworks like it, platforms like it, are really advantageous to run containers. You can get away with running containers on, um, on like, say, Amazon boxes with um, System D, but um, after a few containers, you don't want to be doing that. You want to be using some kind of um, deployment fabric or uh, platform. Minimal aside, microservices do multiply the challenges. Yeah? So here, for example, we've got three pipelines going on, and one pattern is to fan in. So we've got like, three microservices. We fan in, we gate on that, and we release that as version one. The second pattern, which is kind of the you know, well-accepted pattern, is that we're deploying microservices independently. This is kind of separate from container stuff, but just bear in mind, if you're doing this kind of pattern, you need to ensure the contracts are met between the microservices you're pushing independently. It hasn't been mentioned at this conference already, I haven't been to all the talks today, but things like Pact, super, interested, uh, super interesting from a kind of REST point of view of asserting in an automated way in your build pipeline whether you're breaking contracts, REST contracts. Uh, Pact, a Spring Cloud contract, RAML, that kind of stuff. If you're in the messaging space, a Kafka doing, or Confluent, who are kind of the stewards of Kafka, are doing super interesting work around using something called Avro to define message formats, because message formats, message payloads, are your schema, effectively, your contract between two services that are exchanging messages, if they're using Kafka. Um, you can use this open source schema registry from Confluent. So just think about these things. Slight aside from the container stuff, you, if you are looking to deploy microservices you know, in containers independently, think about the, the way they work together. And things like Pact, things like um, Confluent uh, Open Schema Registry are super interesting to assert contract validations in the build pipeline. It can all be automated through Maven, that kind of stuff. Great stuff. Let's now step through our pipeline and, and kind of look at the four key points of, of what I've, I've mentioned. So we'll start in development, yeah, and hopefully not a controversial um, statement, but you need to make your local development environment as much like production as possible. Yeah? Um, obviously, you're not going to be running Amazon on your laptop, but you need to make it as close to production as possible. Yeah? And for me, I do a lot of Spring Boot work at the moment as well, and so I often don't really change much the way I work locally. I'll develop in just, you know, Spring Boot's got an awesome workflow, dev tools, uh, plugins, brilliant on Maven, that kind of stuff, uh, code away. And then I'll put that Spring Boot artifact, the fat jar typically, and I'll put that in a container and run happy path tests locally before pushing my code up to GitHub. 
Yeah? I like to get that kind of testing. I like to get the feel for how things are going to work in a container locally. Definitely perform the, the happy path test is my strong recommendation. Install Docker, it's super easy, or another container technology on your laptop. Run the happy path test, because if you start pushing stuff up, and that is totally a valid pattern, but there's more of a paths like pattern. Things like Cloud Foundry allow you to do CF push, where you're developing locally, and CF push pushes it, runs through a pipeline, and gets deployed. That's more of a proper paths like experience, and that's great. I'm loving the paths stuff. But in containers, it's a bit more raw. You need to be running containers locally to kind of get the feel for them. One thing I see quite a bit is I highly recommend using identical base images from production. So I've seen some developers say coding on Ubuntu locally, like packaging Docker containers with Ubuntu in them, because they're comfortable with Ubuntu. And I like Ubuntu, yeah? But they're running, say, CentOS in production. And CentOS and Ubuntu have different kind of dynamics around security and a bunch of other things. So what you get working locally, and then they repackage it into CentOS later on, it starts behaving differently, yeah? So do check these things out. Basically, the Docker file, which is effectively your manifest of what is going in the container, is the content is super important. Yeah. And again, probably a biased audience with the fact you're at DevOps, you're kind of a self-selecting audience, you're keen to learn, you're probably reading your blogs, you're probably ahead of the curve compared to, say, 95% of developers out there. But Docker files, this kind of stuff is super important in terms of being operationally aware. I work with many large enterprises where people are not operationally aware. They're not comfortable with the command line. They're not comfortable with um, you know, looking at processes and using Vim to hack around with stuff. Totally, I'm totally cool with that, but I have to, we have to empathize with them. So we need to say, you know, a bit of education piece, when you're now deploying something in a container, it's not just the jar. It's not just the war. We're bringing in an OS, we're bringing in config, we're bringing in build artifacts, and we're exposing ports. And all this stuff from a security point of view, you know, it's a bigger attack surface now, yeah? And we, we need to really think about these things. I'll talk about security more later. Even, I've had a few companies trip over whether they use the JDK versus the JRE. In, in production. Well, I'm always like, JRE, obviously. The JRE is a smaller attack surface, smaller runtime, and you don't need the JDK when you're running stuff in production. But these kind of things, if you're not operationally aware, you never perhaps thought about this stuff. Do you use Oracle Open, or Open JDK? And obviously the two are blending now, so that's probably not an issue going forward. And there's a whole bunch of questions, but what I like to kind of wrap up and say in this space is please talk to your sysadmin team. Yeah? Even developers need heroes, as they say. Yeah? And I'm not an operator, you know, so I'm firmly in the developer camp, a bit of op skills, but this kind of stuff is super, super valuable. One of the biggest things, I, the biggest impacts I often make on projects, if I get there early enough, um, is to get InfoSec involved early, to get the ops team involved early. Otherwise, when like my team and I, we arrive late in a project, and um, people are building containers and shipping their Java apps, and InfoSec and ops have got no idea what's going on. As an individual, like politically, they get a bit offended, like I haven't been consulted. But even from a technical point of view, they get offended, and quite rightly so, because they've got no idea how the runtime is going to be changing. So get sysadmins, get the ops folk in as early to the process as you can, if you're looking at microservices, if you're looking at containers. I see some people pitching around having different test and production containers. So my test container is maybe Ubuntu, full fat. Uh, maybe I've got some test tools in there. Maybe I've got some databases in there with pre-canned data. I think it's easy to see drift between these test containers and the kind of production containers. Yeah? So there's a couple of interesting patterns. One is the test sidecar pattern. Anyone who's familiar with um, things like Istio and Kubernetes, you're familiar with the sidecar concept. But sidecars are effectively something that sits next to your main container. So you build your container like it's going to be in production. You know, JRE, super stripped down, fat jar running in there. And you build a sidecar container with all your dev and test tools and everything you want. And you can link them together in your chosen platform, Docker linking or Kubernetes pods or whatever you want. Yeah, um, Use that. There is a couple of interesting proposals. Uh, on test is an interesting one by uh, Alexi. There's an interesting blog post there. It talks about some patterns around how to test um, things uh, in a container, how to build and test in a container, which I think is super interesting. This is perhaps less relevant now since the announcement earlier in the year at DockerCon, uh, I'm not sure which DockerCon it was, but I think it was the European one, of these multi-stage builds. So people have sort of been exposed to the multi-stage builds now. It's super cool if you haven't. You, you'll notice there's actually like two from statements here. And this is a Golang example, but you're, this is a kind of build container effectively, and this is the runtime. But we're defining it all in one Docker file. And that, for me, is less chance of those things drifting. I do my building and my testing here, and then I do my packaging here. Yeah? And again, same thing. You know, this is Go, but it could equally be Java. We could be building in uh, Oracle, uh, 
Oracle container, or Oracle uh, Java container, and we could be shipping in Alpine, for example. And um, this kind of ticks the box for me, as in because we're going to push this version of the container all the way through the pipeline. This is a transient container, effectively, yeah? So it kind of doesn't violate my single kind of binary thing. I think this is a really useful pattern. Um, check it out. Now, I do this talk on many different languages, to be honest, but um, this is a Java-specific or a Java-focused one. People often ask me at the end of the talk, is there such thing as an Oracle Java container? The answer is yes. Oracle, uh, from I think since the last... Um, Java 1, like a year and a bit ago, and they've released kind of a whole bunch of interesting stuff on GitHub. So go to Oracle's GitHub. They maintain a whole bunch of, um, yeah, Oracle Java on Docker, for example. I don't know if Java 9's there yet. I checked a couple of weeks ago and it wasn't, but check this out. What is super cool in the Java 9 space is there's now there's a port to uh, Alpine. So many of us had a hard time running um, the JDK in Alpine. And Alpine is a nice OS because it's a really stripped down OS, much more uh, lower attack surface, lower resource footprint than, say, something like Ubuntu or Debian Jesse. So we like using Alpine as our root, as our base container image. Um, but it used to be a pain to get Java working with that sometimes. That is no longer an issue. It is early access, heads up. But um, kudos to the Oracle folk for um, putting this together. You can now get a Java 9 Alpine kind of very small uh, OS, a uh, very small container, which is nice. Uh, so um, Sander and Paul's book is awesome. We're going to hear lots about modules in this conference. I haven't played around with it enough yet, but this for me kind of go, it blends nicely with the, the idea of containers, the idea of unikernels, this kind of thing. Single responsibility, tightly packed containers, low footprint, low security attack surface. Um, J-Link is very interesting for creating very minimal sort of runtimes of Java. You can define your module, modules and your modules of your um, stuff you're pulling in, and you can basically ship it as a kind of binary, which is really attractive rather than shipping, say, a container with a J JRE and a, you know, some config and some other stuff going on, your, um, your, your fat jar, for example. The benefits are reduced footprint, performance, and security. This is good stuff. Yeah. So this is, again, pretty uh, new and emerging, but I strongly recommend you check out Sandow and Paul's book. It's a really good read. It's on Safari. I've got it through there. Um, this stuff, I think, is gonna, we're going to see more and more the, kind of the combination of modular programming, and microservices, the way we build containers and, and unikernels, and Java itself now is embracing modularity. So I think this is really cool. Moving on, point two in the pipeline. This is the kind of um, creating our image. I'm not going to talk lots about this because it's quite techy and quite boring to some degrees. My report goes into the details. There's a GitHub code base you can clone locally and, and play around with this stuff. I uh, use the CloudBees Docker Build and Publish plugin. Uh, it's open source, super useful. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in actually how you build images, check out the mini book and grab a copy at the end of, of the talk. It, it is interesting now you need to um, build your artifacts, put it in a container, and um, push it into a registry. I use Docker Hub quite a bit, to be honest. Um, so I store like, my images. For example, the images in, uh, in the book I talk about are stored on my Docker Hub account. But there's many other kind of registries. We'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Uh, Core S Quay. Even things like JFrog Artifactory and Sonotype Nexus support containers along alongside typical Java packaging formats now as well, which is super cool. We'll mention them a bit more later. One thing, moving more onto the metadata. So consider we've kind of built our container. Metadata, super, super important. A bit of a red flag uh, up front. Uh, be aware of the latest tag in Docker. Yeah, it's a bit of a misnomer. Latest simply means the last build tag that ran without, a, or last build, sorry, that ran without a specific tag or version. I've seen people new to Docker getting tripped over this. They're tagging things with a version. Someone else is not tagging and then pushing kind of up to the registry and overwriting these things. And what you're deploying into production as latest is actually not what you're thinking it is. So uh, I'm not going to do justice as much as this blog post can. Check it out if you want the details of why you should not use latest. I highly recommend using semantic versioning instead and, and, and tag your stuff like this, Daniel Run UK test 2.4.1, that kind of thing. Metadata in general, and this is not you know, particularly around containers, but I think the containers are drive, making it more, um, more, making me more aware of these things. But metadata around the stuff we build as engineers is really important. Like, um, as we're pushing more stuff more and more fast now, we perhaps can't always rely on semantic versioning. Instead, perhaps we want a Git sha of what we're pushing up. We want build metadata, like who did the build, you know, the, the vendor involved, these kind of things. And we probably want to add somewhere into that image we're building, that artifact we're building, things like have we done QA control? 
Docker are doing some cool stuff with the ability to sign images to say, hey, yes, QA have looked at this. It is good to go. We've, we've cryptographically signed that image, and we can only deploy into production if the signature is valid, for example. Um, we want to put perhaps security policies on, things like AppArmor and, and, and SecOmp and things like that. We want to package them very close to our artifact because the artifact, the container, needs to be run with that SecOmp profile to, to minimize the attack surface, for example. Yeah. There's a bo bunch of different ways we can add metadata. And this is containers, it gets a bit more tricky. You can use, in Docker, you can use Docker labels. It's well documented on their website, kind of key value style stuff. You can see down the bottom here. Um, you can create like a, a DNS kind of thing like we do in the packages in Java. Uh, and you can add metadata, all good stuff. Hat tip to microscaling systems. They've got a really cool make file that kind of uh, automates a lot of this stuff. So it, when you run the make, make file, it builds your container, looks at the system date, looks at your Git SHA and a bunch of other stuff, and weaves that into your Docker uh, manifest, your Docker file, uh, and then kind of ships that. So that's, this is a really nice way to automate scraping a lot of relevant data from your, your build, whether you're running it locally or in, in a CI system. A few more interesting things. Um, label schema, they're trying to come up with an idea sort of uh, around um, standardizing the namespacing of labels. Um, so if, you want, if you're interested in that space, I think it's super interesting as well, because Docker have, for example, reserved a few namespaces in labels, that kind of thing. So worth checking out. You can add labels at runtime. You do basically like docker run dash d and add the label, or the d is just running in daemon mode, but as you can add the label at runtime. This doesn't add it to the docker file because you're adding it to a running container. So first off, that new label you're adding is not going into the manifest. But more importantly, as soon as the container is stopped, the label goes away. So you need to docker commit to add the label into the metadata. But by doing that, you're effectively creating a new updated version of the container. And that kind of violates my single container uh, idea. There is a talk about um, adding the ability to update more uh, dynamically. There's a proposal on GitHub. If you're interested, you can check out the GitHub issue on the Moby project now, I guess, not Docker, uh, probably on the Moby project, um, if you want to get more info. In the meantime, what a lot of uh, I've been doing with clients, we've kind of we've, we've worked around this. My team and I, we kind of got together a couple of interesting proposals. One is Liz, and, and she works at Aqua. Uh, Aqua are doing a lot of really cool stuff around security in the container space. So if you're really you know running uh, high um, performance or, or you know. Uh, highly valuable containers, I should say, in, in production, definitely check out Aqua. I've got no affiliation with them, but they are super cool. Um, and Liz has come up with a prototype to allow us to put metadata into a Docker registry. So a Docker registry stores the containers as, as blobs, binary objects, but Liz has got this um, prototype where you can now store metadata alongside in the same registry. It is proof of concept, but it's super interesting because you keep the metadata very close to the container images. There's less chance of stuff getting lost. There's only one thing to look after. Super interesting. But in the meantime, to be honest, most of the time what I do now is I use things like JFrog Artifactory um, and Nexus. Yeah, Nexus, you can store your images as well as your... Um, uh, your actual uh, jars and ears and wars if you want to. I typically generally recommend just storing the jars. Um, as DevOps is a family-friendly audience, I will point out the frog is merely hugging the whale. Yeah, yeah. Jan Barrack actually told me that one a while ago. I looked at it and I was like, oh, yeah, that's maybe not PG-13, that one, is it? But it's purely hugging the whale, yeah? But good bit of branding on, on JFrog's part. So looking at the, sorry, looking at the sort of the testing space, yeah, these are just a few brain dump ideas around you know testing containers, how I've done it in the past. Uh, in the book, I've got a super trivialized service-based um, shop, like it's super simple, but it's just a couple of Spring Boot apps, a Drop Wizard app, just to give you some sort of stuff to work with. Um, if you were doing stuff real, like testing a real thing, you'd obviously have maybe like an API gateway, Nginx API gateway. You'd obviously have data stores in the mix, yeah, but. The book simplifies it down to share kind of key concepts. And if you were just, say, testing the product catalog, just testing the single service, I often use things like Jenkins Pipeline as code. I love Jenkins. I've been a long time supporter of Jenkins. But Jenkins 2, I think, is super cool. Jenkins Pipeline as code is, is really interesting. You can basically create arbitrarily complex uh, pipelines. Um, and you can use Groovy kind of DSL to, to build these pipelines and do cool things. So one project we, we worked on recently, well, Actually, it's probably a year ago now, to be fair. We were just spinning up individual containers. We're basically you know, building and packaging our, our product catalog, Java, Java archive, jar file. And we're just using, uh, this is CloudBees plugin. We're doing Docker. We're saying the image. We're running it. You will notice I've not put a version there. Shame on me. There should be always a version there. My bad. Um, but then we're simple Groovy script. It's basically setting a timeout and waiting until the health end checkpoint um, returns a certain kind of um, 
value back so I can grep and up on the health check. Again, the actual mechanism here, this is just some groovy syntax to make it work, and this is trivial, but you can kind of put anything you like there. You can run, say, um, Gatling to do performance testing. You can run security stuff there. You can run a whole bunch of stuff. This is the power of the kind of pipeline as code. And why I really like pipeline as code is you can store everything you do here as code alongside your application code. So you've got an application code, you've got your Docker file, you've got your Jenkins file. That for me is awesome, yeah? I like to capture everything I do in code, yeah? Because that way it kind of speaks for itself. It doesn't drift from, yeah, I've got a Word document over here saying stuff or whatever. Capture as much as we can in code. I've learned that from some of my mentors over the years. As much as you can capture, keep it close to the application code it's running. Um, this stuff is really good for, um, for longevity of the service, I, I feel. Integration point of view, say we're doing some load testing maybe at the front door, we've got, you know, we want to exercise all the services, like maybe just an area, maybe not the whole system, but we want to do an area of the system, for example. I often use things like um, Docker Compose or Kubernetes, for example, yeah? Um, we've done a bunch of stuff like with Amazon, you spin up um, Jenkins nodes, and, and you basically have like a node as a single kind of workspace, and you use Docker Compose to spin up um, all your applications, and you run something like Gatling or JMeter uh, on those services that have been composed with a description file. So this is something like the code we've done in the past. You'd have like sort of a build, and then again you'll recognise the pattern with the timeouts. Just we're spinning up Docker Compose in daemon mode. That's firing up all our services. We're waiting until we get a health check confirmed from the main service, and then again this is just a trivial you know shell and, and grep. But you can run security testing. You can run Gatling. You know. The world is your oyster, basically, yeah? Once you've got this one node spun up as a kind of a mock production, you can just hammer that node and do whatever you like with it and feed the results back into your build pipeline and fail the build if something goes wrong. What I've been playing around with lately, I've been doing some work with DataWire, so hat tip to DataWire, doing some really cool stuff. If you haven't heard of telepresence and you're working with Kubernetes, go and Google telepresence because it enables you to proxy into Kubernetes clusters and you can develop locally as if you were in the cluster, which is super awesome. All open source tools, really good. And this one is really nice. It's called Kubernaut, and it's basically a way to manage a pool. Uh, I think it's GKE only at the moment, Google Cloud. Um, you manage a pool of clusters and you can basically sort of pull in things when you're doing tests, and then release it when you've done your test. So you maintain three or four Kubernetes clusters in GKE, and then your pipeline pulls them in and uses them when, it's doing a, uh, when you're doing a test run. And use Helm to manage dependencies like MySQL or whatever, super cool stuff. So just chucking that one out there, it's, I find this useful. Testing what we call non-functional requirements in the build pipeline is super super important. Now, I don't like the term non-functional requirements because I've seen quite a few systems that were not functional due to non-functional requirements, yeah? You know, we've, we've rolled in and someone's gone, oh, it's, it's going to be a, you know, a million users. We've only designed it for 10,000 users. Or, you know, oh, it's kind of, um, we didn't realize it would be deployed on an internet-facing site. We thought it was a private app, that kind of thing, yeah? A lot of these things we need to think about. And now we can kind of test them in the pipeline. There's still a bit of glue needed sometimes, but things like um, Gatling and JMeter, really cool for doing for performance. It, well, I use Gatling a lot because it's a very simple Scala-based DSL. It's really descriptive. You can do testing as well as kind of um, all the stuff you can do in JMeter and kind of more. But the cool thing is you can actually spin it up into Flood IO. Flood IO is a commercial service. You can pay them some money and they'll run your Gatling scripts as is at scale which is really cool. So you write some scripts, you run them on your local machine, you run them in your pipeline, and when you want to do load testing, you can actually spin up like a cluster in, say, Amazon or something, or in Azure, and you can pay Flood.io to hammer that service, uh, hammer those services, which is really nice. Security testing these days is table stakes, yeah? Security testing is table stakes. We as developers must get more responsible, and I'm looking at myself when I say this as well, otherwise we're going to be regulated. And I think it's inevitable that we are going to be regulated now. Um, it's going to take some more disasters, unfortunately, but even things like Equifax, where no one lost their life, but there was a lot of bad things happened around the Equifax fallout. We as developers need to make efforts to ensure security testing is baked in, yeah, from the word go. And things like FindSec bugs is a version of FindBugs that's focused on security. Uh, OWASP, if you haven't heard of OWASP, go to their website. They've got amazing resources for running automated security testing. Things like BDD Security, it's a behavior-driven design framework, very readable, that automates something called the OWASP Z attack proxy. And it does automated penetration testing uh, on, on um, your services. It doesn't replace penetration testing as a proper discipline, but there's nice kind of, you know, basic stuff you can get in there. 
Things like Gauntlet and Server Spec check if your um, boxes you're deploying onto, your instances are hardened. Same with Docker Bench. You know, is this kind of um, box we're deploying onto configured correctly for running Docker? Things like Core S, um, Core S Claire, um, and Docker have got their own version of it as well, are container static scanners, container image static scanners. So you can do static scanning of your code, find bugs, find sec bugs, but things like Core S Claire scan the container image. Because don't forget, with a container, we're bringing in our jar, we're putting in Ubuntu, Alpine, Debian, whatever. We need to scan that to make sure no heart bleed is snuck in there as well, yeah? Um, now, it used to be quite tricky to run Claire locally. You can pay Core S to run it. I highly recommend that. You pay Docker to run it. highly recommend that too. If you really want to DIY it, um, well, actually, before I mentioned the DIY thing, one final thing. Very interesting gent called Aaron Gratifiori did a talk at DockerCon a couple of years ago, um, and he's written a white paper for the CIS around um, container security. Goes right from like syscalls all the way up to principles of least privilege, covers the whole security stack. If you're serious about security in containers, Aaron Gratifiori stuff, read the InfoQ blog post, uh, check out his video from DockerCon. I just, it was gold, gold mine of information. I didn't understand all of it, but it was a gold mine of information, and it's given me pointers to know when I'm out of my depth. I go and chat to the ops folk and say, hey, is this an issue for us? That kind of thing. Um, sorry, the core S thing, allowing you to statically validate the container security. Um, oh, it's, still, it's actually another slide, so I messed around with this presentation. <laughs> sorry. Um, so before that one, you need to verify what you're putting into the container is your Java app is secure. And have people heard of OWASP dependency check at all? So, oh, if you, excellent. Ah, oh, that's, that's great. I'd like more hands next year if that's cool. Um, totally worth doing. If you're in um, the Spring Boot world, or actually in the Java world, to be honest, it's a simple kind of 10 line um, Maven plugin. And what that does is it phones out to the National Vulnerability Day -day Database and says, hey, I've got all these dependencies we've brought in, all these um, you know, artifacts we've brought in on Maven, log4j, you know, take your pick. And it says, is there any critical vulnerabilities or exploits in the versions I've got in this Maven file. And it reports back, you can run it, like I ran this on a very old, oldish Spring Boot app the other day. Uh, this is just a local build, but it reports back, I think I've actually got it here. These are all the CVEs found in my very simple um, uh, build. It's like, you know, a six months old, a, a year old, or whatever, a very simple Spring Boot app. I'm not picking on Spring Boot, Every Java app's got their issues, but it made me think some of these known vulnerabilities are old and we kind of accept them. Other ones we need to perhaps update our dependencies. We need to keep an eye on this stuff in general. You get a nice report out of it as well, so you can show, um, like say, you know, the rest of the, your team, show your leadership. This stuff is really, really important. We need to make sure what we're putting into our jar is good. Yeah, that's, that's, num that's number one kind of thing. Make sure the security like, of our, jar is, uh, our Java app application is solid. Then we go on to the static scanning. Apologies um, for moving around there. But I did um, this version of the talk at Container Shed, I think it was, a couple of months ago in London. Really awesome gent. At the end of the talk, Armin came up to me and said, hey, love your stuff, but have you heard of like, these, this other stuff he's been working on? And I hadn't, and it was awesome, freaking awesome. So he's basically created a Docker image with all the Claire stuff set up inside it. So now it's like a real simple download. You do have to build some stuff in Go at the moment, which any of you working with Go, you know it can be a pain in the ass to get Go working sometimes. But um, once you've got the, the simple build working, um, it, you can run it in your CI pipeline, you can run it locally, it's really cool. Um, this is an example of the kind of, yeah, I had to fiddle around with the package structures in Go and there was it uses a make file with um, go depths and stuff, and it's a little bit fiddly, but Armin has been super, super helpful. Hat tip to Armin. Helped me a bunch on Twitter, on DMs and stuff. Managed to get it working. So now I'm actually looking forward to using this rather than perhaps paying Core S or paying Docker as much as I love them as well. Um, but I might use this for some projects. To get it. I can put this Docker image in my um, pipeline. Right, so just a heads up, yeah. I, the other day, pulled down uh, Docker pull, OpenJDK, 8 JRE, ran the test, and these are the CVEs it found. These are the critical vulnerabilities. Yeah, don't be shocked on some of this stuff. Like it's been there for a long time. Um, you know, do your due diligence. Some of this stuff is important to your organisation. Some may not be. But the first point is get awareness of this stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, well worth checking out this stuff. This is for me. Security is pretty much table stakes these days. Uh, I think we, as you know, really. Anyone who comes to a conference, whether your leadership is in your title, your job title or not, you're kind of an aspiring leader. You're, we're the kind of vanguard. You're the vanguard, pretty much, of the development industry. So we need to start thinking about these things before other people do for us, like politicians, for example, yeah? I won't get on my high horse too, too much here. But really think about this stuff, yeah? It's really critical. We as an industry, I'd much rather we self-regulate than have a, someone else regulate it for us. But at the moment, we're being a bit slack, I think. 
So I work with a bunch of companies um, who are agile. I'm sure many of us in the audience identify as being agile. Um, and they often push back when we all start talking around non-functional requirements and building them into the pipeline. They push back and they say, no, no, we're agile. So we build stuff. We, we defer our decisions. And we wait until the last responsible moment. This concept of a last responsible moment, I think, is awesome when it comes to functionality. We start a project, we don't know too much, we learn a bunch of stuff, we make a decision before it's the last, we make a decision, sorry, at the last responsible moment. We've, you know, we know nothing here, we've learned stuff. If we don't make a decision here, it's either made for us or it'll be a bad decision. Yeah? Last responsible moment is really, uh, Dan North talks a lot about this stuff. I love Dan North's talks on these things. Kevlin talks a lot about this as well. This is all good stuff. But the kind of news flash with some of this stuff in relation to NFRs is sometimes the last responsible moment is up front. Yeah? With security, with architecture, with performance, sometimes we've got to think about these things up front. And I find it really hard to sell this to my business colleagues sometimes. They, I say, you know, they, they give me some great list of functional requirements, and I say, how many, develop, how many sorry, users is it for? And they're like, well, make, make it scalable. Like, yeah, I get you. I say, how, sh how secure should it be? Or make it secure. It's like, you know, this stuff is really woolly, yeah? So we really need to think about these things. Um, modern platforms and architecture, things like... Um, Kubernetes, Docker, containers, you know, this kind of things and microservices don't necessarily make this easier. Worked on some projects where we had polyglot stack and we suddenly had to retrofit security into it because um, for various reasons, and it made it really hard. We had 20 things, 20 services, three languages trying to retrofit security in. Um, so, yeah, microservices are amazing in terms of velocity, but they can be more tricky um, to, to fit things like, you know, NFRs in. If we don't think about these things up front, it leads to this culture of fixing fast, I call it, yeah? And the choice here is I can fix this right or I can fix it fast and show me what fast looks like. And once you've got this kind of, you know, fast, it's broken windows all the way down through and a pipeline will not help you then. You need to kind of instill in our culture this kind of, you know, architecture and, and so forth. Mechanical sympathy. Uh, people heard the term mechanical sympathy. I'm a big fan of Martin Thompson. Yeah, awesome. So Ma Martin's uh, blog is actually called Mechanical Sympathy, but it's a great concept. Um, and I'm a big F1 fan, love Formula One. And that's when Martin explained it, it really resonated with me. Uh, one of the great uh, British drivers, a Scottish actually drivers, uh, Jackie Stewart, uh, was very mechanically, it was very sort of aware in terms of mechanical sympathy. He was a great racing driver, but he understood enough about the car engine to get the most out of it. Yeah. He couldn't build an engine, he wasn't an engineer or whatever, but he was mechanically, he had um, sympathy with the mechanics, so to speak. Um, not the mechanics, the people, sympathy with the actual engine. Yeah. Um, and this is really good. And I think we, you know, the best engineers I've worked with, I've been very lucky to work with some amazing people, they have this notion of mechanical sympathy. They probably couldn't build a CPU, but they know how one works. They know about branch um, mispredicts, they know about cache misses, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I think we as developers should build our mechanical sympathy. And when containers come into play is a whole new bunch of things coming in. So in particular, pre-Java 9, so Java 8, and the JVM was not fully C group or task set aware. And this meant that if you, and I actually had a project with this, we span up a, I think it was a 64 core box, and we put like, you know, um, 64 um, containers on the box, pinning one CPU to each container. You can say in control groups, pin a, con you know, pin a container, pin a Linux resource, one container to one CPU. Problem is, the JVM not being C group aware, it thinks it's got access to the whole box. And back 20 years ago when Java was created, this made total sense. You spin up a box, Java gets all the box, yeah? These days, it's not so much that mechanism, that, that mindset. So although C groups do constrain the JVM, it can never access more than what you give it. It will base calculations like fork join pool and GC based on the number of CPUs it believes it has access to. And this has caused confusion in some of the applications I've run in the past. JDK 9, as far as I'm aware, fixes these issues. There is a couple of um, JDK bugs I've highlighted. It may be backported, but have a chat with Brian or, um, or Mark actually to confirm that. I'm not, I haven't checked in the last month or so. But just be aware of this thing. You know, if you're deploying onto a multi-core uh, box, which is very common if you're going into the cloud, Azure, you know, Amazon, um, Docker and Java may not play well together. And it's not just Java. Other languages have the same kind of issue. We as Java developers are super used to dealing with things like heap space size, heap size, yeah? But you need to allow a bit of overhead if you're deploying something into a container. If you've got a two gig heap, you probably need a two and a half gig um, memory allowance in your container. Partly because the JVM has certain overheads like Metaspace or PermGen, that kind of thing, but also because like native threads. Um, 
Native threads require native system um, resources. So I had a really thread-heavy uh, application, um, and it was basically all the threads were eating up memory, and, and the JVM was being oom-killed by Linux and uh, killing the container effectively. Or sorry, killing the process in the container because there wasn't enough memory for these native threads to actually get. So they got the privilege... The JVM got um killed, uh, added memory uh, killed. So think about things like that. Think about allowing an overhead for your memory allowance in your container. Final one uh, is entropy. Uh, um, so entropy basically is kind of the randomness. Like uh, in a local machine, it's you know, banging the keys, moving the mouse. In the cloud, it's kind of uh, network packets coming in, maybe the, the fan speed or whatever. Entropy is kind of randomness that is collected to do cryptographic operations. Yeah? So computers aren't really good at doing random stuff, um, so they need kind of randomness entropy to do these cryptographic operations. Now, a lot of uh, applications, uh, platforms, Java included, um, uses typically dev random to generate the, the stuff needed, the randomness needed to do cryptographic operations, like signing things, creating session tokens, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I never really bumped into this as an issue up until I started using containers, but I started using containers. We were in the cloud running lots of containers on a single, uh, it was Amazon AWS, uh, single AWS node, and applications were blocking randomly, just stopping. Like they'd start up or freeze, they'd, they'd be running and they'd freeze. And we started, we were JSTAC and we looked at the stack trace and we noticed these containerized Java apps were always blocking on crypto operations. Yeah? And then we did some blogging around, it's a couple of years ago, did some blogging around and we suddenly realized that what, um, it was Spring Boot at the time, Spring Boot by default uses dev random and dev random, if it does not have enough entropy from the box, there's not enough randomness there and it's very easy to exhaust the entropy in a highly container cloud platform, it just blocks. Yeah, it's the Linux file system blocks. And there's a good reason why it blocks. You can read the man page and stuff. But it, it can be a pain. It causes a lot of problems. My team found the issue. I was super grateful when they did. You can get around it. Um, Spring, actually the Spring Docs, if you mentioned this, by using something called dev u random, which is pseudo random, as opposed to using real randomness. I've had lots of discussions over the last few months about whether this is secure or not. I believe this is for most people, but I've put some notes on this. There's some other, another gents that a very nice blog post explaining the difference between using dev random and dev u random. There is some subtle differences around randomness. I believe, for like most of us, using sort of you know doing web apps and stuff, dev, putting this flag onto your Spring Boot app or your Drop Wizard app will get rid of the uh, entropy problem, for example. But we need to think about these things as Java developers. Yeah, we need to become more ma mechanically, uh, more mechan have more. Sorry, we need to generate more mechanical sympathy. I'm not going to cover the topics of deployment or observability much. Deployment uh, is really cre critical. Um, the book will go into more details, I guess, and then there's plenty of great blog posts out there you can read. I like the Amazon. It's Elastic Beanstalk, but it talks about different deployment models, the trade-offs between green and blue, red, black, and uh, rolling, and all these kind of things. Um, I did a talk about service meshes, and I think Ray's talking about service meshes here. Ray's always great fun to watch, so go and uh, check out his stuff. If you're interested in things like Istio and Envoy, all that good stuff, I think that's where the um, kind of Kubernetes space is heading for deployment. Observability, I mentioned that arrow closing the feedback loop. Observability is super, super important. James, Qatar, uh, James Turnbull stuff, Qatar on Twitter, awesome bo uh, book, Art of Monitoring. Uh, he does it better than I will, so I I'm going to just point you in that direction. We did a blog, uh, did a interview on InfoQ that kind of wrapped up some of the monitoring challenges with containers as well. Because in containers are generally more ephemeral, and we're now measuring in the kind of millisecond or seconds as opposed to minutes. Some of the existing things like Nagios are more geared towards a, a different time frame, so that makes sense. So I use different, I use like Datadog quite a bit and Prometheus now to, to do monitoring. Wrapping up, so I've only got a couple minutes left, but I hope that containers are not silver, but I hope people don't think, sorry, Containers are a silver bullet. They are an amazing bit of tech, yeah, but they're not a silver bullet. If anyone's read you know, Fred Brooks' stuff, there are no silver bullets in IT. I've been working in IT now for like 15 years, and I, yeah, there are genuinely no silver bullets. When you are, if you made the decision to go to containers, should you go all in? And some of the vendors at the moment are kind of selling this thing. You know, we completely replatform everything. It all looks nice and shiny. You know, we can containerize everything. I'm actually a bit of a fan of this, yeah? going a bit softer in this kind of stuff. This is often used as a derogatory image for Docker, but I like to start small, do lots of learnings, then get big, yeah? rather than go all in. You know, I've seen a lot of people spend a lot of money on doing big replatforming things over the years, and I like to start small and, and do learnings. 
Some people say to me as I'm on my consulting journeys, oh, this Kubernetes looks a bit complicated. I'm like, yeah, it's complicated for a reason, <laughs> and it gives you great abstractions, yeah? So you still want to learn a whole bunch about Kubernetes, but Google are doing some great um, stuff around training around that, so you have to learn about these things, but they kind of, some people will get that not invented here thing, and they're like, well, this Kubernetes looks a bit complicated. Should I build my own platform? Probably not is my answer, yeah, unless you're Google, Amazon, or IBM, or Microsoft, for example. Um, whatever you do decide, there's probably some glue stuff. If you're going to use Kubernetes, there's probably some glue stuff you need to build uh, yourself. Whatever you do, push it down a pipeline. Make sure your infrastructure is being continuously, continuously delivered as well. And Keith's book, um, Keith is just like, that's an amazing book. It won't make you an Ansible or Terraform expert or whatever, but it will give you the core primings of understanding what infrastructure as code is and how to build a pipeline around it. A great book, fantastic book. He does lots of cool talks as well. Finally, just want to mention, using containers does not get rid of the need for good architecture. Good architecture, in my mind, is about leadership, about shared responsibility, about um, just enough upfront design, a whole bunch of things like that. But containers do not take it away from you. Otherwise, you get this kind of pattern. Yeah, we cram this monolith into a container and called it a microservice. Yeah, which is hat tip to Kelsey, Casey West. It's not my stuff. It's Casey. He's got some awesome stuff online. But, you know, just got to caveat the talk by saying that. So I'm... Um, Bang on time, I think. This is the summary. Yeah, continuous delivery, vitally important in modern, modern architectures, modern platforms. Think about things like metadata, um, your, single, um, your single image, uh, single artifact going down the pipeline for all the testing must now be a container, not the jar. Don't repackage it on the way down through. Think about things like mechanical sympathy. Educate yourselves, educate your colleagues around these things. Assert the properties in the pipelines. So run those kind of um, security things, run those performance things in the pipeline. The tooling is there now to support us as developers. A few years ago, it was a little bit ropey, but the tooling is there now. But we just need to reapply the classic kind of continuous delivery practices with these new tools and tech. I'll share the slide deck online because I haven't given you enough information yet, obviously. So um, apologies for the brain dump, but this, yeah. I'll share the slide deck online. These are books that have been super helpful to me on my journey over the last sort of three or so years with containers. Um, I'm going to, like, you have to excuse me now, I'm going to kind of do a beeline to the O'Reilly um, stand. Uh, um, please come and chat to me. I'm in the conference today and tomorrow, um, and I'll be signing books in like 10 minutes' time. I'll run straight there now. I'll be giving away this. It's only a small mini book. It's the full one's coming later, but I'm happy to give you away, uh, give away some, um, some tips, hopefully, that I've learned over the years, and as a GitHub repo with the code and stuff as well. So at that, I shall say thanks for listening. Appreciate your time.